So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Barb Whipke. Thanks for coming, Barb. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, some of you have probably already met me either in the store or through one of these talks. So I'll just give you a little background. Bird feeding has always been a hobby of mine. Uh, love the birds, find them extremely relaxing. When I come home at night, first thing I do even before I let my dogs out to potty is look in the backyard and see who's visiting the feeders. Um, first thing in the morning, looking out there before I leave. Sometimes if I stop in during the day, it's hard to get back out the door. Um, depending on the activity. So any of you that are already feeding the birds, I am sure you experience the same thing. So tonight we're going to be talking about winter bird feeding. As I said, I always enjoy feeding the birds, but I especially get excited in the winter when I see my winter friends return. There's certain ones that we look forward to, those juncos, often people call them snowbirds. Um, white-throated sparrows, the yellow-belly sapsucker, which is a woodpecker, um, all of those, the hermit thrush, so lots of good ones that we only get in the winter. Um, this winter we are in the midst of an eruption year, so I'm sure your feeders are extremely busy and you're seeing some different ones that normally don't spend the winters here, so hopefully you've had a chance to see some different ones. So many of us have turned our yards into a refuge for ourselves. You know, we put the fire pit, the barbecue, and you know, the poles, the hot tubs, all that good stuff, the gardens. But if you haven't turned it into a refuge for the birds, that's a really cool way to add to the excitement for yourself. And it's a great way to help the birds. The, we know that the weather impacts the birds. Of course, they have to try to keep warm. Typically, our feeders serve as a supplemental source for the birds where they get about 20% of their food from our feeders. The rest, they're gathering from the trees, the seeds, the berries, all that good stuff. So our feeders are just kind of a backup plan. In the winter months, that kind of flip-flops and they start becoming a little more dependent on our feeders to get them through. Um, you know, it may be that their natural food supplies have already been depleted. If there's snow on the ground, the snow may be covering it. Um, this year with all the rain we've had, it's hard for them to gather food and things when it's raining. Insects, of course, they're not finding a lot of those out there. So our feeders become just more important. The other issue for the birds is songbirds only eat during daylight hours. Five o'clock at night, it's already turning dark. So you're gonna notice your feeders are empty. In the morning, it doesn't get daylight very early. So they have a shorter span of time that they can eat but they need to eat more because they're expending more energy trying to keep warm. So the way we can help them through that is keeping those feeders full. A songbird can use up 75 to 80% of their fat reserves in just one winter night. So then during the day, overnight, they've burned up 75 to 80% of that fat that they reserved. Now they've got that short window in the day to replenish that to get ready for the next night. So they can be a day or so away from starvation at any time. So your feeders are definitely more important to them than any other time of the year. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do to create that refuge in your backyard is obviously have feeders. So check those feeders out. If you've got old feeders that are cracked, if they're damaged, if they have sharp edges on them, anything that's gonna be dangerous to the birds, it's time to replace those feeders. Clean those feeders. If they've been hanging there for a while, it's time to get those cleaned and ready for the birds. Um, one of my favorite feeders, I've got one of them here, is actually our EcoClean feeder. This. 
So on the EcoClean feeder, it has an antimicrobial coating. What that does is to prohibit the growth of mold and mildew in that feeder. Another plus for this type of feeder is that the bottom pops off. If you've ever had to take a screwdriver and dig into the bottom or unscrew it to get it clean. So when you're replacing your feeders, look for those feeders that are easy to clean. Look for a way to keep that seed dry. You can add weather guards to them. If you don't have our feeders, we have other weather guards that can be hung from above up here. But think about adding a weather guard. One, that's going to protect your seed, keep your seed drier, but it's going to allow the birds to continue to feed when it's raining or snowing. So that's going to help them out. If they're expending, using up all those fat reserves and we have a rainy day, it's pretty tough for them to replenish. So think about adding a weather guard, finding a way to protect that feeder so that they can get in out of the elements to eat. Hanging feeders, it's great to have a variety of feeders. So if you can see, I've got some here that are hanging feeders, but also adding tray feeders are another great way. This tray feeder, you can see we've got a roof on it. So again, if you already have a tray feeder at home, take the measurements of it. If you don't have a weather guard for the top, take your measurements and stop in and we can help you hopefully find one that will cover that to help you out there. Um, or if you can bring that in under some type of roof or something to help protect that. The cool thing about tray feeders is that any bird can eat from a tray feeder. On those feeders, something like this. It's a cool feeder, but our birds like our cardinals, which everybody of course loves, Cardinals have a short, thick neck, so they can't land on a perch this way and then turn sideways to get into the port. They need to eat forward facing. So in this case, what we do is add trays to them. So then that allows them to land on the tray and eat. So check out your feeders. Make sure that your feeders have a spot for those cardinals, juncos, white-throated sparrows, some of those birds to be able to land on a tray and eat from it. So just take a good look at your feeding station. If you want to come in, feel free to take a picture of the feeders you have or a video of them and bring them in and we can help you work with what you already have so you're not replacing a lot of products. Consider adding a ground feeder. So this one is a ground feeder here. You can see it has these cool little legs, has a nice tray that pops out so it's easy to clean. The cool thing about ground feeders is those doves, those dark-eyed juncos, white-throated sparrows, all of those birds that like to eat from ground feeders or that typically eat on the ground, those are the ones you see under your feeders. By offering something like this, where you've got a roof on it to keep the seed dry, you're gonna attract more of those birds in. And you're probably saying, yeah, the squirrels would love that. <laughs> we do have a couple solutions there. Um, on that particular one, I use either safflower. Safflower is a white, very hard shell seed. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that well or not. If not, you will have to stop in and see us. But it has a hard shell, but it also has a bitter taste. Birds, songbirds don't really have much of a sense of taste. Squirrels can taste, so they typically don't like that. With that said, if they're desperate enough, they will eat safflower. At my house, I have one or two that will nibble on it, but it really slows them down. So to me, it's worth it. And that's safflower, S-A-F-F, -F, not sunflower. Sunflower, your squirrels would really appreciate you for putting that one out. We also have some hot pepper seeds that you can use. Again, those birds don't have that sense of taste, so the hot pepper works really well. Safflower is very high in fat, so that is a good one to use. The hot pepper seeds that we have have a lot of nuts in it. Um, we have a suet 
nugget bark butter bits that again has that hot pepper in it. So those are good ways to, to be able to feed on a tray feeder or a ground feeder that's not baffled. Uh, da, da, da. So when you're putting that tray feeder, you want to put it, I'm sorry, the ground feeder, you want to put that about three feet from some type of bush or covering. Somewhere where when a hawk comes by, a neighborhood cat, something like that, that those birds can quickly get to shelter. Unfortunately, this time of year, when there's not many lizards and frogs and things out there for the hawks to eat, they too do turn to our birds a little more than we would like to see. Um, the positive in that is when you have a hawk there, he's catching the older, the weaker, the sicker birds. So he's keeping your bird, see, bird feeding station healthier. It's not, hard, not easy to see, I know, but if you think of it that way, he is keeping it healthier for you. So, but just have that bush or something you know, it can be if you've got a porch that has a covered area, just some place where the birds can dart away to get to safety. And then foods. We want to think about changing the normal foods that you're feeding. We want to add a lot more of the suet products, which are high in fat. So things like the typical suet cakes, you've probably all seen these and tried these. So it's a great way to feed. Um, this particular one is our super suet, highest fat, highest protein on the market. The ingredients on it, number one is the suet, then it's peanuts, mealworms, almonds, pecans, walnuts, and then we add some calcium just for, to give the birds an extra little boost, helps them in the development of eggs and that as we go into the spring. So super suet's the best one out there. Hot pepper super suet. Again, keep those squirrels out of there. We've got the hot pepper on that. So definitely you want to increase the suet you're offering. I feed suet in multiple formulas. I use the suet cake, bark butter. Probably a lot of you have tried the bark butter. Coolest product ever. Um, kind of looks like peanut butter. You basically use a fork and you can spread it right onto a tree. We have feeders you can put it on as well. Um, I put it right on a tree and all the little crooks of the branches on the side of it. The birds absolutely love it. Again, I use, this is the regular version, but we have it in hot pepper. I use the hot pepper version because I have lots and lots and lots of squirrels. Um, they, uh, the other day I watched a few squirrels running, playing tag right through the bark butter never once thinking to stop and eat it. So um, definitely a good option. This is another form of suet. It's basically the same product as those squares we're all familiar with, but it comes in a round formula. The nice thing about that is it's much bulkier, heavier, it's going to last longer. So you're not going out there changing it as often. And it can go, we've got several different feeders it can go in. This would be one example of it. This one is made to look like a log. You just drop it in the top there and it has different size holes on it based on the different woodpeckers that we have in the area. So that's another way to offer suet. Then the bark butter bits I talked about, that's that same product as the bark, bitter, bark butter, except it's just in a different formula. So that's the bark butter bits, that's a tongue twister. And then we have the buggin' bits, which is again, it's those bark butter bits, but it's mixed with dry mealworms. Dry mealworms are another one that's high in fat. So offering as many types of suet as you can is beneficial. So find it, you know, if you don't have the feeders for it, then think about using the products, you know, the bark butter that you can just spread right onto a tree or a fence post. But just really look for ways to increase that suet. Um, then foods. So I recommend in the winter months, looking into using some of the foods that are already shelled. So, hey, grab. This particular one is 
a no mess plus formula. So what it is, it's sunflower chips, it's peanuts, tree nuts, cranberries, cherries. So it's a good variety of food. The plus it using something like that that's already shelled is the birds aren't going to be expending excess energy shelling their food. So if they're coming to the feeder, they're grabbing that sunflower, now they have to go hang out in this tree and shell it so that nobody sees them and comes in and snatches them while they're eating. Then they come back, you know, they get that little tiny nut out of there, come back again. So they're just expending a lot of energy doing that. So by doing the no mess, they can come right to the feeder and eat quite a bit just hanging out there. The plus for us is we get to see them while they're hanging out there. So instead of them going off to the tray, you get to see them at your feeders a little more. Uh, another great one is a winter super blend. This one has already been formulated. It has all of the high fat stuff already in it. So you can use it alone. You can mix it with whatever seed you're currently using. Just kind of use it as a supplement for them. That's a great way to do that one. That one also comes in a cylinder feeder. If you're not familiar with cylinder feeders, these have a hole in the center and then it's as easy as you can just take a feeder, something like this, pop the top off. It has a little rod in the center and you just slide it on. Again, the positive with that is it's going to last you for a while. So you're not going out there in the cold, changing your feeders, adding food every day. I had a customer at our La Plata store today tell me that she has to go out and fill her feeders four times a day. So that would get old pretty quick if it's snowing or raining or cold. So you want to look for ways that you can feed without it becoming a chore. If it becomes a chore, you're just going to drift away from the hobby. So find a way to make it easy for you, but also to make sure that the birds know that there's always going to be a meal there for them. The plus with that is when it comes nesting season, they're going to nest in your yard because they know they can then bring their young to your feeders to teach them where to find the food. So definitely look for ways to keep food going all the time. Peanut splits are another really cool way to feed. So basically it's just peanuts that are already shelled and they're cut in half. Nice thing about that is you're not having birds wasting the other half. They can grab, grab just the half they're going to eat. So many of our birds are peanut lovers that people just don't realize. I think the two most surprising ones to people are usually cardinals and bluebirds love, love, love peanuts. We know our woodpeckers do, chickadees, titmice, Carolina wrens, a lot of our typical ones we think of, the nuthatches. Um, but it's often surprising to people to realize just how much those bluebirds and cardinals love their peanuts. Look at adding, finding a way to add peanuts. If you've got a pole system that you have a baffle on, that's the easiest way to be able to feed the peanuts and the foods without worrying about the squirrels. The key to that is you want a pole system that you can put somewhere that you have a 10 foot clearance around it. That's anything the squirrels could jump from. Then you need to make sure that that pole system is high enough that when this feeder is hanging down, you can put a baffle at about five feet and the feeder is hanging above that. What that does is when you've got that baffle, the squirrel can't climb up the tree and get to it. You've got that 10 foot so they can't launch themselves onto it. And the baffle keeps them from being able to just jump from the ground up and grab it. So the baffle would go at five feet. The feeder needs to hang above the top of that baffle. So check your poles, and if you've got poles that are high enough, we have aftermarket baffles that we can put on those. But just check your feeders, measure them, make sure that the bottom's going to be above the five foot mark. And if so, you can grab one of these baffles, add it on, then you're going to be able to add peanuts, whatever you want. I feed peanuts in the shell, out of the shell, 
nut mixes, fruits, everything, and never have to think about it. But it wasn't always that easy. Let's see. So black oil is a good seed to feed in the winter. It is very high in fat. So it is also one that you can feed. Um, you will see the birds taking it and storing it away. They'll put it in little crevices, barks of the trees, things like that. They prefer something with a shell if they're going to store it away. So definitely in the fall, we recommend to customers using something with a shell. Safflower or black oil are the go-to because that allows them to store up for the winter. At this point, they're not so much storing, but it's survival at this point. So you can do the black oil, but it's not as beneficial as it would be in the fall when we're allowing them to store it up. Peanuts, let's see, did I miss anything? Like I said, those suet cylinders are just a really cool way to feed. This is another style of that feeder. Pops off here and you just drop the cylinder right onto there. We even have really cool characters. This one is Buttons the Snowman. So he would just drop right on there. And so it looks cute too while you're watching the birds eat it. We even have one that has a, well, we have two squirrels so the birds can get the revenge. Um, but one of those are in hot pepper. So the squirrels tend to not be interested in that one. So we've got the food taken care of. We're gonna make sure we keep those feeders filled and cleaned and keep an eye on that. We want to give them roosting spots. So birds need to find places to roost for shelter. You may notice if you've got a porch that's covered underneath, as you walk past the sidewalk, you'll hear lots of scurrying under there. They tend to use those a lot. Um, roosting pockets are another good one. Just something as simple as this little piece here. I hang these on my front porch where my hummingbird feeders typically are and I have a Carolina wren, actually a pair of them that sleep in it every evening at dusk. We see the two of them go in there together. Carolina wrens really like to be close to our houses. So hanging, if you get these ones for the wrens, I recommend hanging them close to your house somewhere because they really, they're the ones you're gonna see making, hanging out at night on the ledge of the porch or over the light or something. So this just gives them a place to hang out. Same concept here. This one is a gourd that you can use. You can use decorative houses, something like this. That one has a clean out port in the back. These ones are kind of cool that they're made out of recycled houses and barns out of Illinois, so that's fun. But any little things like that. And then for our ones like our bluebirds, our larger birds, your house that you would use for nesting leave those up. I know we used to be told, oh no, take them down in the winter. I have about seven that are living in one of these houses. They just pile up in there for body warmth. And that's the bluebirds I'm speaking of. They will pile up there for body warmth. Come late February, one of those pairs will decide they're going to nest in here and everybody else gets the boot on that. So this one, if you're going to put a house up, I recommend looking for a few things. One that you can get into easy when they're nesting, one that you can clean. In fact, right now, go out if you've got houses already up, check them out. If you still have last year's nest in there, pull it out. If you go out and there's just a little bit of pine straw or something in there, it doesn't look like it's been nested in, you can leave that. I would say somebody is probably roosting in there at night, but if it appears that there was a nest in there, go ahead and clean that out. Just pull it out, use a paintbrush or something and brush anything out of it so that they can use that to roost in at night. A lot of, we start hearing about December, January, people, the bluebirds are already checking out the house. They're actually looking for a spot to roost in at night. So that's what they're doing. So go ahead, uh, when it, people ask me, when's the best time to put up a bluebird house? My answer is always yesterday. Bluebird houses are beneficial to our bluebirds year round. Bluebirds do not migrate. They stay here with us 365 days out of the year. 
So definitely get those houses up sooner rather than later. We recommend not putting them on trees. Snakes and raccoons will go right up a tree into there. This time of year, hopefully the bluebirds would know ahead of time the snake is coming, but when they're nesting or they've got eggs in there, that's not gonna be an option to get the babies out in time. So when you're mounting those bluebird houses, mount them on a pole with a baffle, something like this, what we call a stovepipe baffle. So it's a very, very long one there and that prevents the snakes or raccoons from being able to get up into your bluebird houses. So if you're gonna put up a bluebird house now for them to roost in, I really recommend go ahead and set it on a pole and put a predator guard on that. Well, we're on that subject. I'm doing a talk with the library next month on bluebirds. So be sure and check that one out too. We'll be covering the nesting and everything. I actually serve as the St. Mary's County coordinator for the Maryland Bluebird Society. So get registered for that one. So nesting boxes, roosting pockets, just putting a brush pile with tree limbs or your Christmas tree, put it out there somewhere. That's a great place to give the birds shelter. If you've got a tree that comes down or part of it needs to come down, if you can leave part of that tree standing as a snag, those birds can, those woodpeckers and that can make cavities in there that they can use for shelter or for nesting. So yeah, don't, make your yard so clean, leave some natural sight. That's also going to help them when those hawks do come in looking. You're giving them extra space, spaces to get to shelter, not only for warmth, but to hide from those predators. So then water is our next one. Of course we know birds need to drink. They need to drink, obviously, because they need to drink, but they also need to drink so that they can properly digest their food, but they also need to be able to bathe. Birds keep warm by fluffing their feathers up and forming pockets of insulation. If they have dirty or missing feathers, they're not able to fluff them and create those insulation pockets. So you'll see them out there in the middle of winter, you'll see them in mud puddles, along the side of the road where the snow is melting, taking baths. So you wanna offer a bird bath. You can go out every morning and put water in that bird bath and then keep an eye on it throughout the day to make sure that it isn't frozen. Or you can go the easy way and add a heated bird bath or add a heater to your current bird bath. We often get asked, well, do you have them in solar? Solar only works when the sun is shining on it, the solar that you would use that size. They're not able to store up enough energy. So at night when it's dark, those bird baths are gonna freeze right up again. So it has to be electrical, but it's basically as easy as you would run that extension cord to hang your Christmas lights. You're gonna do the same thing with the bird bath. got a couple different style bird baths. This one is designed just to sit on a stand. The heater is all internal on it, so you're just going to plug that in. They are not, it's not going to create a sauna for your bluebirds or your birds. It's only going to keep it above freezing. So if you put that your hand in there, that's going to be very cold water. It's thermostatically controlled. It's just gonna come on and off as it needs to. So if it's warm during the day and it doesn't need to run, it's not going to run. So that is a great one. If you have a metal or plastic bird bath, we have a heater that can just be added to your bird bath. I don't recommend these for ceramic or concrete. They will work in there. The concern is if we have a power outage, if a squirrel chews through the line, knocks the bird bath out or the heater out or a deer knocks the heater out, that water is still going to freeze and it's going to, the ice is going to crack your ceramic or concrete bird bath. 
So in that case, if it's ceramic or concrete, I recommend taking the bath part in so it's not gonna hold water. Um, we do have some plastic ones that you may be able just to add to your current stand. Plastic will do the same thing. It's going to crack if it freezes. It's just a whole lot cheaper than replacing an entire bird bath. So check that out. Um, if you've got a wooden deck, we have one that mounts right onto your deck rail. We don't recommend it for the vinyl, but if you've got a wooden one, it'll clamp right on there. When you go to clean it, you flip the little lever, pick it up, empty it, snap it back in place. So those are really cool because you can bring the birds right up to your windows that way. So now is the perfect time. You know, we haven't had much snow at all to speak of. We're just starting to get into the cooler weather. So use these sunny days to get your yard ready. Put out quality feeders that's going to hold a large capacity of seed or the cylinders, things you're not going to have to be out there four times a day to refill to make the bird feeding easy on you. Look for ways to keep those feeders dry and clean. Make sure you're keeping those feeders full of high fat food and then be consistent with your feeding. Don't let those feeders run dry. The birds will find another place to eat, but it is tough for them this time of year. So this is not the time to decide, oh, I'm not gonna feed them this week. Um, try to keep those feeders going if you can. When we do get snow, one thing you're gonna see is a big mass of blackbirds move in. When that happens, a couple things you can do. We have cages you can put on feeders. That safflower, that was that white seed I talked about. Those blackbirds aren't able to crack that shell. Our small songbirds still can. It's one of the cardinal's favorite foods actually. So you can switch your feeders out to safflower. If we have snow that's coming in, you may wanna put a piece of tarp or plastic down underneath your feeders. Once the snow comes, you can pull that up and you've got bare ground under there for your birds to eat from because a lot of those ground feeders will be on the ground eating. Um, so either stamp down, if you don't do the tarp, then shovel around some of your bird feeders to give the ground feeders space to eat. And the biggest thing is not to forget the water. Find a way to get water to them, whether if you're home during the day and you're able to keep going out adding water, not hot water, just room temperature water, um, that's a big help for them. If you, we do have one more thing I will mention that we do offer if you're new to bird feeding. Normally we do a lot of beginning bird feeding talks in the store. Of course, this year is kind of crazy. So we are offering bird feeding 101 where you can email us or Facebook message us and we'll set a time for one of our certified bird feeding specialists, either at this store or our La Plata store, to set up a, an appointment with you for you to come in. We walk you through the store, show you everything and kind of give you a, a starter course. Um, and we do that privately that way. So it's, we're not doing the large group events and that. So with that, um, what questions do you have for me? Okay, Barb, we have several questions. Okay. I went ahead and, and put up the link for the February Bluebird class. It's going to be February 10th at 6.30. So the link is in our chat if anybody wants to register. Um, the first question, and this may have been answered, what is the best food for woodpeckers, nuthatch, cardinals, finches, Blue Jays. And then this person wrote shelled peanuts. But this kind of, I kind of have the same question. Should we not be putting the shelled peanuts out right now? Should we be putting, or I'm sorry, should we not be putting the peanuts out in the shell, but sure. in using the shelled peanuts? So you can still do the peanuts in the shell. I do those year round, but that's basically feeding our, mostly our Blue Jays and tufted titmice. So not all of our birds eat peanuts in the shell. Um, downy woodpeckers sometimes will, but for the most part, 
that's just your blue jays and your tough to tip mice. But yeah, definitely still feed those too. Uh -huh. uh, but then also the peanuts that we talked about, the peanut splits, you want to have those out. Um, we have several different feeders. Hey, Chip, would you grab that new acorn feeder that just came in, the one I just showed you? Um, so we have several different peanuts that you can, several different feeders that you can put those peanut splits into. Most of the birds that are, a lot of the birds that are eating peanuts are going to be our clinging birds. So this is a cute one that just came in, looks like a little acorn there. Mm -hmm. And then those clinging birds would just hang from there. You can use the feeder, something like this that we talked about, just a regular seed feeder and use a mix that has peanuts in it. So that's going to allow those cardinals and bluebirds to eat from that. That other one is going to feed the clinging birds, the red belly woodpeckers, the downy woodpeckers, the nuthatches, chickadees, tufted tent mice, all those ones. What was the name of the mix that you mentioned? You put up the bag and I missed the name. It had um, berries in it, nuts. Uh, um, that's the No Mess Plus. Okay. That's a great winter blend. And then the other is that winter blend, which okay. is, this one is extremely high fat. So I do, with this one, I do one feeder that just has the winter blend in it. And then I mix some of the winter blend in my tray feeders too. Interesting enough is when we were having kind of that not really winter weather, I noticed the winter blend wasn't going down. A few days before it started, we heard it was going to start turning cold. That level in that winter blend just started going down. Birds know ahead of time what the weather's going to be. So they start preparing in advance. We had customers coming in and saying, the birds just are acting so frantic because they already knew that this cold weather was coming in. And so they had to start packing on the pounds. Wow, that, that's interesting. Okay, let's see, we have another question. Is the safflower good for ground feeders? I missed the connection. Okay, yes. Yes, it absolutely is, yes. I use that in my, until we had the fiery feast, that's what I always used in that ground feeder I showed you. Now that we have the fiery feast, which is our hot pepper seed, now I put a combination of both in there. Now, do you find with the ground feeders, I know if you put that out in the summertime, it would be knocked over and gone because of the raccoons. Do you find that it's um, bothered during the winter? With, uh, uh, with using the fiery feast, the raccoons aren't as interested in it. Okay. In my yard, I use, we have a wildlife blend, which is peanuts in the shell, out of the shell, black oil. It's called the wildlife blend. Mm -hmm. And I put it out in a low bird feeder back in the edge of the woods for the squirrels, the raccoon, the fox, whoever wants to eat from that one. So that's way more attractive to them than the hot pepper seed. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's see. I'm new at feeding birds, now have four feeders, noticed 25 to 30 hawks in the big oak not far from our feeders. Yikes. Just mentioned that they're going to eat my birds. So sad. Okay. So that's not going to be hawks because they don't flock like that. Um, if you can get a picture and send it to us, bring it in, I'm going to guess that that's maybe crows or vultures or something like that. Uh, but hawks don't flock in large numbers like that. So whatever it is, you're kind of safe. So do you think the vultures are going to eat the birds? Mm -hmm. Will the vulture, oh, they won't. Okay. Vultures um, clean up our earth. So they eat dead things. Okay. If it is vultures, they are very messy birds. Um, so you don't really want them roosting around your house. What we recommend if you start noticing them coming roosting around your house is right at sunset when they're coming in to roost, go out, make some loud noises, shoo them off so they don't roost there and move them on. Uh, but they typically come to our houses or come to places to roost 
you see them a lot of times down around the library where there's trash dumpsters. Um, they're looking for nasty stuff to eat. Okay. Um, can a cylinder feeder be a fundamental feeder? Can you show cylinder feeders and the hot pepper cylinders? Yeah, can you grab us some hot pepper, uh, hot pepper cylinder? Yeah, so I think what you're thinking is the foundational feeder. Yay, somebody has read The Joy to Bird Feeding. It's an awesome book we have here uh, by our founder, Jim Carpenter. He wrote it in 2017. It's just an awesome book all about feeding the birds. So yeah, they absolutely can be a foundational feeder. What a foundational feeder is, for those who don't know, it's that one single feeder the, the birds know are always going to have food in it. So we have plenty of customers who feed off of their decks. We can't squirrel proof feeders off the decks. Actually we can because we have a feeder. Would you grab me an eliminator? Uh, we have a squirrel proof feeder that can be used. But yeah, this is the regular size cylinder. We have one that's about twice the size of that one. And that absolutely could be your foundational feeder. If squirrels are an issue for you, this eliminator is also another great option. This one has a weight here so that when the squirrels land on it, it's going to close down on them. It doesn't hurt them, it just closes so they can't get the food out of the port. And they tend to move on. Once they found that they can't get any reward there, they just move on. But yes, absolutely. Um, for your foundational feeder this time of year, if you're going to use it as your foundational, I would use the large size hot pepper cylinders because you they will go through the smaller size pretty quickly this time of year. As we go into the late summer, drop down to the small because the rain, humidity, those things can mold. So use smaller sizes then. But this time of year, definitely go with the big feeders or the big cylinders. Okay. And, and I did want to point out, Barb, I had a feeder that I had a, a cylinder feeder and I noticed that the birds weren't coming to it. And when I went out and took it down, it did have mold on it. So um, if you're recommending, you know, I took it all off and everything, but is there anything in particular that you would clean a feeder with? Yes. If you've got mold on it, we need to clean that mold off and we need to kill kill those mold spores. Otherwise, when you put another cylinder on there or more suet in there, whatever the food is, it's going to immediately mold again because those mold spores are still there. So you're going to use a bleach and water solution, one part bleach, nine parts water. Clean it really well in that solution, rinse it well, let it dry, and then refill that feeder or that suet feeder, whichever it is again. So that's good. The bleach is better than using dish soap or something like that. Yeah, we need that. We need the bleach to kill it off, to kill those mold spores. So if you notice a feeder that's not being eaten, go and check it. If the seed got wet, the birds aren't going to eat it. So you're going to want to toss that out, toss it in the woods, and let somebody else eat that out there. Um, but instead of just wasting it, if you put it out there, there are other critters that are going to come along and eat that. But those birds have to be extra cautious with the, what they eat. And they know that that food is no good. My dad used to tell me, if you're ever lost in the woods, watch what the birds are eating and eat what they're eating. I think that's interesting because I would assume that the birds would eat anything, but that's not true. It's not now. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, this person was just commenting that they have a Carolina Wren living under, she has a Carolina Wren, Lina Wren living under her porch, entering and exiting through the lattice work. So that's interesting. Yeah, very classic location for them, yes. Here's a question. Can bluebirds nest in the straw acorn looking shelter or just house shaped structures? I guess it's a particular question about bluebirds. You had the um, woven little acorn looking house. Yeah, that's actually for putting peanuts in this one. Yeah, oh, one I about it. In pocket. Yeah. this one probably. Right. Yes, okay. and bluebirds are too small for or too big for that. That's going to be for a chickadee or a Carolina wren. So for your bluebird, you want to actually put up a bluebird house. 
something like this. And then they're going to, several of them are going to live in that together over the winter. In fact, there was a year, it's probably been, oh, about five years or so now that we got a really late March snow. Some of you probably remember that. Unfortunately, bluebirds are our first nesters of the year. So they start pairing off in late February. And that year, because they had already separated in the nest boxes, it left just the male and female in those nest boxes to survive. And a lot of people went out to find that their bluebird pairs had frozen. So that's an unfortunate situation. So if it's late February or mostly early March, I would say, if we are to get a cold spell that's a surprise cold spell, a few of the things that I would have you do with the Bluebird House is on the side here, we have cross ventilation because it is so hot in the summer when they're nesting. Stuff that full with like weather stripping or a rag or something like that. You can get the insulated foam and you can actually just bungee wrap that around your house to provide extra insulation for them. So if you find that come March, we get some weird weather, um, think about doing things like that to weatherproof that because most likely at that point, you're going to have only a pair living in that house together. And they won't mind you fiddling with their nest or anything? No, no they're perfectly fine with it. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, all right, here's another, well, I put the link up about the Bluebird program. Um, would you recommend the bouncy squirrel corn feeder on your main bird feeding station? No, because that main bird feeding station, we want to do our best to keep our squirrels away from it. I would take your, that's our squungy is what they're talking about. It's a really cool feeder that's like spring, it's bungee activated and the squirrel jumps on it and it just kind of bounces and spins and, and it has corn cobs on it to actually feed the squirrels. So we want to take that away from the bird feeding station. We want to pull the squirrels away from our bird feeders. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is there a weather guard for the seed cylinder finials? Yes, there is. Hang on, it's coming. <laughs> this is why my husband comes by after work so he can be my go-to for these things because I can never think to bring it all. <laughs> so what this person is talking about is this one that pops right on the top of our pole system. So if you see this pole system back here with the hangers, you can on the top put this and then drop one of those cylinders on top of it. So once you have that on there, we have this little roof that can be added to it. I definitely recommend adding those because on these cylinder feeders, we're usually putting them up high. So we do tend to go with the larger ones so we don't have to get onto a ladder to change it as often. So definitely put a roof on those. I have only ever one time had this one fly off. And that was that crazy when we had a month or so ago. Yeah, but normally this one stays really good and does a great job. And, and I also use some large cylinders. I'm sorry. Metal, so it probably won't crack or anything. No, it's it's metal, um, has a, a powder coating on it to keep it from rusting and everything. I noticed you had a guard on that feeder that you were showing us that works if you have squirrels. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I have one of those, but it doesn't have a plastic yeah, so we can add a weather guard to that as well. Okay. If you want the easiest way to do the weather guard is just bring the feeder in and we can put it right on for you. Okay. You need to come in empty so that we can put that on because it has to come completely apart. Okay. Uh, or you can come in and get the weather guard. We can show you how to do it, how to put it on. Okay. But of course, the easy buttons let us do it for you. But <laughs> Which is very and that is one note um, on the feeder cleaning. We do offer feeder cleaning here. Okay. It's $10 a feeder or three for 25. So a lot of people, if they're buying the weather guard, they'll bring the eliminator in, have us clean it by the weather guard at the same time so that once it's clean, we put the weather guard on for them. So that's an option too. And then the people have to leave it, I would assume. Yeah, it's, we say it takes 48 hours, but we try to have them done within 24 hours. 
Okay, that's nice to know. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Are you going to have less birds if you do not have a water source available close by? You are, yes. Um, definitely will have fewer birds. Um, I like to think of it as you'll have more birds if you have a water source nearby, so it's not quite so negative. But you will definitely increase your activity. Um, if you have a feeding station and your neighbors on both sides have feeding stations and you're the only one with water, you're going to find that the birds tend to migrate more to your yard because they need to drink, they need to bathe, and they're smart enough to know what their needs are. Um, we always recommend in the fall, be very diligent, diligent about keeping those bird baths full and clean because they're already scoping out where they're going to spend the winter. Um, and then if you're a good, good landlord and through the winter you have the water and you've kept the food going, then they're going to look at your yard for nesting too. So it just continues to build that population in your yard. Great, that's good to know. Okay, um, can you talk a bit about this being an eruption year? Is it too late to get evening grass beaks if we haven't seen them yet? It's not, and I'm still holding out hope for my yard. I have not had evening grass beaks yet. Just last week, we had a customer in Leonardtown that had them. Um, we've got, so what an eruption year is to back up is when there's a shortage of food in the north, birds migrate further south to find plentiful food sources. So they only go as far south as they need to to find those food sources. So as the winter goes on, if they're still running out of food north of us, they're going to continue to come our direction. So we are still seeing people um, reports. It's, we're not seeing as many of the grass beaks as we had the evening grass beaks, but we are still hearing of them. Um, more recently, we've had several reports of Baltimore Orioles. So get those oranges out, get that grape jelly out. Um, those are birds that most of us have not seen in our yards here in Southern Maryland, even though it is our state bird. Uh, but definitely um, last week, I know there was a Leonardtown reporting. Um, we suspect one um, at our La Plata store today. We've got a customer in Swan Point who has a painted bunting. Those birds shouldn't even be here. So it's a really, really cool bird year. Uh, so keep those feeders out, get a variety. The more types of variety of foods you have, the more birds you're going to see. Birds food, choose their food based on the shape of it. So adding more shapes is a good thing. Now you, you mentioned, I know we've talked about the uh, jelly before and the oranges before. Real quickly, can you tell the people that are here tonight what would you put that on in this winter feeding? So a lot of different things that you could do. Um, grab one here. You could do a feeder, something like this. You can cut an orange in half and just lay it in here. You can put the jelly in there. If you've got any kind of little cups, you can put the jelly in there. You can cut an orange in half and lay it on a tray feeder. Um, a, just about anything. Um, and they'll eat raw jelly? Well, it's grape jelly grape is jelly. the type of jelly you want to use. We sell one here um, that we recommend. It's not as sweet as our jelly. It um, doesn't have all the additives as what we do, uh, but grape jelly is what they're looking for. Okay. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, okay, we have another question. Have you heard of Carolina wrens chasing away other birds? Mm. I guess it really depends on what the situation, any of them can get, any birds can get aggressive. Um, Carolina wrens will do a couple cool things during nesting season. They'll take every potential nest, they're cavity nesters, so they're looking for houses pockets, things like that. Um, it, they pick weird nests. Um, if you have a coat hanging outside, they may use the pocket of that coat to nest in, a boot, a whatever. But they will, the male will build a nest and he'll, every potential 
nesting site within a certain area there, he's going to start to build a nest. And then he's going to choose one or two to actually build up. She'll come along and decide whether, yeah, which one she wants to use. But the reason they do those other nests is to discourage other birds from nesting nearby. Okay. So that is one thing. They're not typically a really aggressive bird. I guess it's it unusual. Is. Yeah, I'd kind of need to know more about this, the scenario to know, to have an idea what might be going on there. Do you ever give your store email out so that people could email you a question or should that be direct? Oh, yeah. It's actually right there um, under me there, the WBU of SMC at gmail.com. Okay. I'm going to put that back in the, in the chat and you don't mind if people no. email you questions. No, okay. Absolutely. Or call us, uh, Facebook message. Perfect. Um, okay, here's another one. Have you seen purple finches this winter? I'm a newbie, so not sure if that's what I'm seeing at my feeder lately. If this yeah. was addressed already, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it wasn't. Um, I have seen purple finches. Most commonly what you are seeing is a house finch, but there are purple finches there too. Once you've seen your first purple finch, then you'll be able to recognize them. In the beginning, it's really hard to tell. The purple finch has a rounder body, whereas the house finch, it's more of a slender body. Uh, the male purple finch will also have, it, it looks like somebody took this little brown and white bird and dipped it in raspberry paint. So the purple color will be more over the bird where on the house finch, it's, it's just a small amount of red. Um, through the chest, um, at the tail, at the rump there. So also with the purple finch, the female purple finch, you'll see kind of white eyeliner and then under the eyes, kind of a parenthesis looking around the eyes. But they definitely are a larger bird, a rounder bird uh, than the house finch. And also the tail will have a little, a little split in the center of it. We do have purple finches and many people have seen them, but more common, or I'm sorry, purple finches. I don't know if I said that right. We're seeing purple finches. A lot of us have had them, but more often we're seeing house finches, which are here with us year round. Okay. We, we just have a few more questions. Um, what's the difference between male and female Carolina wrens? There's, it's not one that you can really notice. Um, the easiest way is the one that is singing the loudest is the male. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, let's see, do any other birds eat oranges and jelly besides the uh, Baltimore Orioles? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Absolutely, um, our bluebirds love jelly. Any of our birds that eat berries will also eat the, the jelly. Carolina Wren love, love, love that grape jelly. Um, mockingbirds love the oranges. red belly Woodpecker loves the jelly. So yeah, even if, if you put that jelly out, which brought me a bottle of it here, here it is, the bird berry jelly here. But if you put that out and even if you don't get the Orioles, there are plenty other birds, you're going to put out just a small amount um, because, you know, you're not going to want to fill up a whole container of that, you'll put a small amount of that out daily. But there are other birds that will come in and find it and eat it. Well, um, with the oranges, do you have, do you do it in slices or a half an orange? I just do half of an orange and then just lay it down, you know, with the open side up in a tray feeder. Um, you can use that cylinder feeder we had, you can put it in there. If you've got our feeding station, hang on a second. <laughs> if you've got one of our pole systems, we have this branch that can twist onto it. And then you can drop the orange right in it, just kind of wedge it down in there, squeeze it in there and pop it in one of those leaves. And you need to watch that or, or say to yourself, well, it shouldn't be out there for more than four days or three, you know. Yeah, you're, during the winter months, you're not going to have to watch it as much as you do in the summer in that. 
Um, in the summer, I'll even see butterflies on my oranges. So, okay, so it's good to yeah. Have in the winter months, the most it's going to do for the most part during normal cold weather. If we get warm weather, who knows? This is Southern Maryland, right? <laughs> um, if we do get warm weather, you, I would check it every three or four days. Okay, and then this person said, is it too early to put the Oriole feeder out that I got for Christmas? So obviously we've talked about that. Yeah, it's no, that's what we're telling people, put those Oriole feeders out. So typically the Baltimore Orioles used to migrate much further south. We're seeing more and more often the last several years, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Virginia, they have had Orioles all winter long. Okay. So I think we're just slowly starting to see it grow this way that you know we're not getting the winters like we used to get okay and then this is the last question and it relates to the orioles um do you have to place the feeder in a certain place it says where do you place the feeder nope. you can put it right so that branch i showed you uh -huh. you can hang it off the pole system and then from those leaves i just hang my oriole feeder right from that okay okay well, that's, I think, let's see, one more last question. Do we have mockingbirds in Southern Maryland? Oh, yes, we do. We sure do. Um, if you are, I'm back in the woods, a very treed area off by myself. The only time I see a mockingbird is when we get an extremely cold spell where they're desperate. If you are in neighborhoods, you're going to see them more often. Um, you see them a lot in parking lots and that around. Um, often you'll catch them as they fly. You'll see, you know, you'll see this gray bird and as it flies, you'll see the white on the wings and that's going to be mockingbirds. But yeah, we definitely do. Okay. And then, um, Grab me an Oriole feeder. yeah, what is an Oriole feeder? You got that. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that one come through. Hang on. We're going to grab, um, we've got some different things you can use for an Oriole feeder down on the bottom under the butterfly feeder. One person while you're getting that, Barb, just said that they saw a Wawa, I saw a Wawa, saw a <laughs> mockingbird at the Wawa across from WBU last weekend. So. Exactly, yeah. So and mockingbirds are kind of cool that they obviously mock. But when you, if you're outside and you hear, they mock all sorts of sound, car alarms and trucks beeping and other birds, but they tend to mock in three notes. So if they hear, uh, if they're, you know, it's a car alarm and it sounds like beep, 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 or let's say beep, beep, they're going to do that. Beep, 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 beep. They're going to do it three times. So that's a good way to tell if you keep hearing this sound that is repeated three times, that's your key that it's a mockingbird. That's cool. So let me pull this out of the box real quick. So this is one of the Oriole feeders that we have here. So it's orange to help attract them in. So it has a stem that comes up like this. You can cut that orange and place it right here. So it would be sitting this way with the stem there. It's got little cutouts here that you can put the jelly in. And then you can mix a sugar and water if you want into the base of it there. And so. that's okay to put out, that won't freeze and crack or anything, or it shouldn't, I guess. If we're, if we're getting below freezing, I would mix, um, add a little extra sugar so it won't freeze as quickly okay. um, or skip completely on the sugar water okay. and just go with the grape jelly and the oranges. Okay. That's good to know. Well, I think I think that's all the questions, Barb. I, we could probably keep you here all night asking questions and listening to you talk, you know, about all these interesting birds. So I think we'll let you go now. But I really appreciate you joining us, and thank you to everyone who has signed on tonight. Be sure to go to the um, St. Mary's County Library website and click on the link for Barb's program on February tenth and you can join us next month for some more bird information. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thanks.